And thanks, uh, thanks Matthew for reading, there you go, thanks for reading that passage. Uh, let me just say at the beginning, we're going to work through quite a few chapters of Exodus tonight, so it'd be helpful to have your Bible open because we're going to be looking back to Paul a little bit, uh, just keep those open. I think it's fair to say that our world, and our culture, and our country especially, have turned, has turned us back on God in so many ways. It's rejected his word, what he has commanded, and what he has set forth, and it's rejected his authority. And to be honest, these days there's a lot of mistrust of authority in there. Um, sometimes those in authority prove themselves to be untrustworthy, or not worthy of our respect or our trust. And you know, I'm sure the news hasn't escaped your attention entirely. There's a lot of mistrust of the police force at the moment, there's a lot of mistrust of the governments, both our own and other countries' governments at the moment. Uh, but even when authority is exercised in a good and perfectly right way, and it's hard, we, we just don't like being told what to do a lot of the time, do we? Uh, many people look around the world and they see injustice, for example, they look at their own right lives and they see things not going the way they would like them to. And, and even if they acknowledge God at all, they kind of shake their fists at him and they say, what kind of God would allow this to happen to, to me or to good people I know? What kind of God would do that? Uh, we're going to work through Exodus this term, and as I said, we're going to cover a fairly big chunk of time. We're going to be looking from chapter 5, which you've just heard read, and we're going to work our way all the way up to the end of chapter 11 tonight. So that's uh, optimistic, hopefully we're going to be here all night. But we're not going to read all, so don't worry, we're just going to kind of uh, read the beginning and the middle and the end of that section. What we're going to see tonight is, is a challenge to God's authority in the greatest sense. A flagrant rejection of God's authority in the most insane way imaginable. And, and the question remains, how will God and how will we respond uh, to that? But let's, let's pray for it and then we'll delve away. Father, we come to you tonight, we come to your word now. And we ask for your help, we need your help by your spirit to not only understand what it is you're saying to us, but, but to have humble hearts, to hear your word and to obey. Please, Father, would, would you soften our hearts now as we hear your word preached? Would everyone here uh, not, not have hard hearts for what you have to say, but would you please change us and challenge us, challenge us and, and change us as a result of what we're going to hear tonight? Amen. Okay, well, we're we to find out to this. The story of Exodus began in Genesis, you'll know. Uh, God chose the family of Israel, the Israelites, to be his, his people with a promise of a great inheritance. Uh, and Joseph, you know, the one with the, the spanky coat, the musical, he was an Israelite, and he took his whole family, the whole tribe, he took them, all 12 tribes, he took them to settle in Egypt. And Pharaoh at the time, he gave them a, a portion of land in Egypt called Goshen uh, to live in. That's to the east of Egypt. You can read that in Genesis chapter 47 if you want. But by 400 years later, the people of God have exploded in number. This region, Goshen, is now overflowing with Israelites. And the Pharaoh and the Egyptians are worried. And so they enslave the Israelites and put them into backbreaking work. But this is what we saw last week and the week before. The Lord God, Yahweh, the Lord hears the cries of of pain and sorrow of his people. And he promises to step in and to rescue them. So he sends Moses and his brother Aaron to speak to Pharaoh on his behalf and to command them, command Pharaoh to let my people go. And what happened, we just, we just had chapter 5 read for us. What happened? Uh, chapter 5, verse 1, we read it again. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Now remember, the Lord there, when you see that in capitals in your Bible, uh, that, in, that in Hebrew is God's name, Yahweh. I am, I am who I am. That's how God uh, defined himself in Moses in chapter 3. But Pharaoh says, who is the Lord? Who is this Yahweh? Why would I, why would I Pharaoh, listen to him? You see, the Egyptians have plenty of gods already. They have uh, gods of the sun and the land and the sky and the sea. Um, uh, they have gods of farming. They have gods of pregnancy. They have gods of good luck. They have gods of storms. 
They have gods of snakes, scorpions, cats, vultures, hippos, crocodiles, everything you can imagine. Pharaoh himself is even in one sense a god. So Pharaoh couldn't care less if his slaves have a god. That's, that's not the issue here. Uh, called Yahweh, or whatever, who, who cares? But if Yahweh sends some old guy called Moses to him and says, the slave's God saying you have to do this, that's when Pharaoh has an issue. Uh, because he doesn't like being told what to do by, by a God of his slaves. So instead of freeing the Israelites, what does he do? He makes it worse for them, doesn't he? Verse 9, let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labour at it, and pay no regard to lying words. Notice that. Give them harder labor so that they don't listen to these lies, he says. Very calls Moses a liar. It's this claim to exclusivity that they have a problem with. This Yahweh that is God of all, that somehow everyone should obey him. It's all lies, says Pharaoh. It's nonsense. But it's pretty similar to the attitude you see in the world today, isn't it? Uh, you Christians have your Jesus, just like they have their Allah. They have their, their Vishnu or whoever. Uh, that's all fine. Worship will be like. We don't have a problem with that. But don't tell me who to worship. Don't tell me what to do. Who is this Jesus that I should listen to him? And actually, the, the saddest part, I think, in this passage is not just Pharaoh's response to God, the world's response to God. The saddest part here is God's own people's response to God. Look at verse 20. Uh, the foreman of the Israelites met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, The Lord look on you and judge, because you have made a stake in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hands to kill us. So the people see what has happened, the extra work, the extra hardship, and do they trust God with it? Do they look to his authority and provision? No. They despair. They turn to the representative of the Lord in anger. And Moses is saying, verse 22, Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. What's happened? Why are they turning to God? Well, look at verse 15, back a little bit. Then the foreman of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? Now, you see, there's a little bit of a play on words here in the Hebrew that, that you, you kind of miss in the English. That the word for serve is the same word as the word for worship in the original language. Servant or slave is the same word as worshipper. So God has said to Pharaoh, Release my people from serving you so that they can serve me. Release my people from worshipping you so that they can worship me. That's what God said. Serve, worship, same word. And so it's notable that that's the word the Israelites use for themselves to Pharaoh. Twice more, in fact, in verse 16. Three times altogether in a sentence, basically, they say, Please have mercy on us, Pharaoh, because we are your servants. We are your worshippers. That's who they describe themselves to be, who they identify as. They're Pharaoh's people. You see, when things get hard, when our plans fall through, when things don't seem to go right, as, as we think they should, that's when we reveal often, do we really serve? Do we really worship? And by that I mean whose opinion and authority actually really matters to us. When you work so hard and your plans just seem so right, it just falls apart. Or you don't get that grade that you really want, or or the promotion you think you deserved at work, or whatever it is. Whose opinion do you really worry about there? Who do you fear telling about it or talking to about it? Do you work hard? Well, good. But who for? Who are you trying to please with your work? Now, when I, when I first started my undergrad degree, I went with a great sense of optimism and ambition. I'd done well in school, I was looking forward to getting started on my degree, and well, I got my first grade back in my first couple of weeks at uni, and well, it was terrible, it was a really terrible grade. And it, and it really upset me and frustrated me, because my perception of myself was kind of shattered. 
I was ashamed, I was annoyed, I was starting to get a bit embarrassed. I really wanted my lecturer to think well of me. really wanted my parents to be pleased with me. And after that initial shame and disappointment, my next reaction was determination. Uh, but not, not just determination to be better next time because of some kind of godly reason. I wasn't just trying to work with my whole heart for the Lord, Colossians 3.23. I wanted to prove to other people, to my lecturers, to my parents, my classmates, that I was a better student than that first grade had shown to me. I was serving my lecturer and my classmates. I was worshipping my lecturer and my classmates. Worshipping them and their opinions rather than their lives. And this is what we do all the time. We might look at the attitude of the pharaohs in the world, rejecting God's rule and authority in their lives, but in different ways we do the same thing. We serve, we worship, we live for the authority of other people. And, and we live for our own authority too. We're happy with God and he fits in with our plans. But he gives us what we want. But we can just be like those who's right and like Moses when he does it. But the good news is that God isn't done with us, and he, he wasn't done with his rights. Look at chapter 6, verse 4. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And let's pick up this, this story back in chapter 7. We're going to read the whole of chapter 7 together. And from verse 1, let's, let's, let's read that together. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my, lap, my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him, and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn to blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, and their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned to blood. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt, but the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained on him, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not even take this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink, but they could not drink the water of the Nile. Seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. Well, 
Well, the Lord has sent Moses and Aaron to represent him. That's verse 1. And so when Pharaoh rejects Moses, he is again rejecting the Lord himself. So what is, what is Yahweh going to do? He's going to send plagues on Egypt of different kinds. Just in the first one, uh, turn the river to blood. Then comes frogs, then gnats, then flies. Then the cattle get ill, then the people get ill. Hail destroys the crops, then locusts destroy the crops. And then darkness falls for three days. Egypt, across nine plagues, Egypt is ravaged. The whole economy is in chaos. The Lord proves his authority and his power over Pharaoh, but also over Egypt's gods. The Lord is judging Pharaoh here. He's judging Egypt's rebellion against its maker. Remember, the Egyptians have gods of all these things. They have the god of the Nile. They have the god of animals, of, of insects and stuff. They have the god of the weather. Uh, they have a God of the sun, when, when God makes the sun high. God is, is reigning supreme. He's demonstrating that he's defeated all of Egypt's gods. All of Egypt's gods are nothing compared to the Lord. And to begin with, the Egyptian magicians are able to replicate the plagues. I remember the, the first one, Aaron throws down his staff and turns into a serpent. They do the same thing. But after the first few plagues, they can't. You know, Aaron's staff eats up um, the magicians. The magicians admit defeat uh, in the end. And Yahweh proves that he's not just the God of, of one people. He's the ruler of all creation. He turns back the clock on creation itself. Uh, he, all the stages of bringing order in Genesis 1 that he did, he, he turns them back, he brings chaos. Even the sun is wound back in. This is a rescue for the Israelites, but it's so much more than that, isn't it? After all, God didn't need to do all this to set his people free. He could have just set the singers, uh, plucked the Israelites into the air, and plucked them in the promised land if he wanted to. So, what's he up to? Why all the carnage? Well, in, this, in these chapters, we're given the answer to that question over and over again. We even heard it three times in just chapter 7. The Lord is redeeming his people through judgment so that all will know that he is the Lord. Uh, chapter 7, verse 17. By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile and just turn to the Lord. Or uh, chapter 7, verse 3. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Uh, verse 5. The Egyptians shall know then that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. In all ten plagues, he says something similar. The Lord is judging Pharaoh and Egypt so that they might know that this isn't just some God of the slaves like all the other gods. So they might know that he is the Lord. He is, he is the great I am. He's the only self-defining one in all existence. But even after the marine terrible plagues, what happens? Nothing. Nothing changes. Uh, flip forward to chapter 10, turn over a page uh, if you need to. Verse 27. Let me, uh, let me read, we'll read a bit more. From verse 27, we're reading the that passage. Uh, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Take care never to see my face again, for on the day you see my face, you shall die. Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. And then chapter 11, verse 1, The Lord said to Moses, Yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the heart, in the hearing of the people, that they ask, Every man of his neighbour, and every woman of her neighbour, for silver and gold jewellery. And the Lord gave the people favour in the sight of Egypt. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out to the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handle, and all the firstborn of the cattle, there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out of you and all the people who follow you. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh and what I Then the 
Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. So God threatens to bring one final, ultimate moment of judgment against Pharaoh and against Egypt. Every Egyptian firstborn shall die. Pharaoh's eldest son, the firstborn inheriting son of every family of Egypt, even, even the firstborn of every family of cattle in Egypt. But Pharaoh will not listen. After all he's seen God do in Egypt, he will not listen. After plagues 1, 3, and 5, we're told that Pharaoh's heart became hard towards what he was hearing. After plagues 2, 4, and 7, we're told that Pharaoh hardened his own heart towards what he was hearing. He actively chooses to be stubborn here. His, his leadership through these chapters is a total car crash. He is insane, actually. He's, he's mad with stubbornness. In his pride, he refuses to listen to Moses. You know, there's that, that picture in chapter 7 of of, the, of, his, of his people digging for water by the Nile as blood, and he just turns and walks away. He's mad. As things get worse and worse, his, his own advisors beg him to listen to Moses. But he doesn't care. There is a picture of what our pride does to our decision making. In the cold light of day, any sin. Any rebellion against God is, is totally mad. It's insane to rebel against the creator of the heavens and the earth. But we're proud. We don't see our sin in the cold light of day. Let me ask you as a kind of side point, do you need help with your sin at the moment? Don't be proud about that. Tell someone, if you have a if you have a recurring sin in your life that you know you need help with, and don't just stop and listen to me. Ask someone to pray for you. Talk to a friend. Talk to one of the poor team at Gary Street at 639 Club Jess. Talk to me. The devil loves for our sins to remain secret in the dark. But don't be like Pharaoh, sitting in Egypt during the ninth plague in the darkness, proudly refusing to admit he's got a problem. Even just talking about sins often takes away some of that sense of victory that it has. Uh, anyway, but there's more because after the other four of ten plagues, and in God's summaries before and after all ten, it's not just Pharaoh that hardens his own heart. We're told that it was the Lord that hardened Pharaoh's heart. Specifically, the Lord did it. Now, what do we do with that? Now, Pharaoh hardened his heart against the Lord, and the Lord also hardened Pharaoh's heart against him. It's not which one, it's, it's both. <laughs> Pharaoh freely chose to reject God, just as God chose for him to do so. And why? Look at chapter 9, verse 15. Go back to the bit we, we, we read over. Chapter 9, verse 15. This is the Lord speaking to Pharaoh. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up, to show you my power, so that my name be with may be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. I could have just made you all sink down, I said. I could have squished you with one, with one pinky. Just come. But I did all of this so that all peoples might see and know me, might know that I am the Lord. And that fits with what we saw at the weekend away from there, doesn't it? Uh, Romans 9, 15, let me remind you of that passage we looked at. The Lord says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God's who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on him whenever he wants, and he hardens whenever. God hardened Pharaoh's heart against him, just as Pharaoh was hardening his own heart. God judged Pharaoh for his rebellion, so that all peoples might know that he is the Lord. 
But this is this is the last and the most key thing I want us to see tonight that, that ties all that we've seen together in the way. Judgment wasn't for everyone in Egypt, was it? Judgment wasn't for everyone in Egypt. Look at chapter 8, verse 22. This is what God says during the fourth plague. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. And the same thing happens during the ninth plague. Remarkably, all of Egypt is in darkness for three days, except not in Goshen. I don't even know how that, how that works, but there it is. In Goshen, where the Israelites lived, the sun shone. And of course, in the tenth plague, no firstborn child shall die in Goshen, promises God. Not even a dog shall growl against my people, he says. So that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. The Lord brings redemption to his people through his judgment in Egypt. So that his people, in a very particular way, might know that he is the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 7. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from the burdens and conditions. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. We know, don't we, the judgment that God brought against the Egyptians is not the last time that God will bring judgment like this. Where God will, will turn the clock back on creation and bring terrible carnage to what he has made. There is another future judgment coming to all people. Where all will know that he is the Lord. This is how Isaiah 66 describes it. For behold, the Lord will come in fire. And his chariots like the whirlwind, to render his anger in fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment, and by his sword, with all flesh, and those slain by the Lord shall be many. For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. It will be worse than the Egyptian plagues for all those who harden their hearts like Pharaoh and refuse to acknowledge the Lord. But, but just like there was in Egypt, there is a place of safety from judgment. There is a safe place. For once again, God's people will be safe in their home. But it won't be Goshen on the east uh, bank of the River Nile this time. Our home, our safe place. Is in Jesus, isn't it? Jesus is where we dwell. We are united to him by faith, by the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is where we are redeemed through judgment. On the cross, Jesus was judged in our place. He was judged for our stubbornness, our insane pride, our refusal to submit to God's authority, our worship and our service to other people rather than the Lord alone. As Christ hung there on the cross, feeling the weight of sin uh, in judgment, creation was undone around him. We were given a great glimpse of that in Matthew's Gospels. Just like in Egypt, there are things that happen as a, as a pointer to the judgment that is that one day come on our life. Uh, the ground shook, the dead came back to life from their tombs, the sky went dark as Jesus died, not for three days like in Egypt, but for three hours. In Christ, just like in Egypt, the Lord brought redemption through judgment. Redemption for us through judgment of Christ. Listen, the whole hardening of hearts thing in this passage might confuse us or surprise us or even offend us. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and there's things going on in your life right now that I don't know about, that you feel angry about. Maybe you feel confused or you just feel like God is, is treating you unfairly. But all of this comes together at the cross. When God gave his own son to suffer judgment in our place, no 
who did he proclaim to be unfairly treated at the cross? Except Christ, who freely gave himself. Because at the cross there is nothing but mercy and grace offered to all. So this week, when you're tempted to live for your own authority, or for others' authority, or the world's authority, look to the cross. Remember who is in charge. Remember who is the Lord. He worked that. He worked the cross. We can't get our heads around that. No one would have made that up. But he is the Lord. And by it we have seen him and we know him. Don't dig your heels in with your sinful heart. And stop us. Don't sit around in Egypt serving and worshipping the authority of other people. Flee to Christ today and remain safely in him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for Christ. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for we thank you for how you've redeemed us and that he faced that judgment so that we could be redeemed. That in judging sin in Christ, you have you have displayed who you are for all to see. All might know that you are the Lord in your glory through what you did in the cross. And Father, tonight, this week, in the coming years and decades of our lives, Father, would we be those who flee to Christ? Would we not be those who, who uh, sit in the dark and, and proudly ref refuse to accept your authority, refuse to accept our sin in insanity? Lord, would you mould our hearts, shape our hearts, would you soften our hearts so that we can trust in Christ and, and be found in that safe